yes, yeah. yes. You know, uh, better late than never. Education is elevation. I'm here today to bring y'all a nice, insightful conversation. I think um, the topic that we're getting into today, a lot of individuals are what I call lost in the sauce of, I'm going to say, gender illiteracy. This means you lack the ability to read and write situations pertaining to gender. And as a result, you see what I'm saying? You drowned it in your own shallow understanding. Uh, this video is dedicated to the individuals that um, you, 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 you have good intentions. You want to be much more of a, uh, a humanitarian. You want to be better at saying what you mean and meaning what you say in conversations pertaining to not only transness, but just the entire gender spectrum as a whole. You see what I'm saying? This conversation is also dedicated to the ones that made C's and D's throughout high school and throughout middle school. And when we get on the internet, all of a sudden you become Bill Nye, the science guy. This conversation is dedicated to the individuals that become science and biologist experts, even though you couldn't tell me much about you know that over there uh pretty much this conversation is for everyone um i'm gonna be playing my little intro and then bringing on some amazing authoritative experts on this topic on this issue you see what i'm saying that put blood sweat and tears into thinking about transness being trans and, 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 and situating you feel me equity and, and survivability on that thing right there you know what i mean um a lot of times we have people that speak for others and uh, this conversation is about centering, you know what I mean, um, the other voice instead of allowing people to be speaking for others. Um, without further ado, though, we're going to start the little intro and then we're going to jump. Pantini's percussion. Yes, yes, yes. How y'all doing? How y'all doing? Uh, before I even introduce y'all, because I don't want to, I, I only want you to say your name. You know what I'm saying? Your name is down there right there. But before we get into the organizations, you know what I'm saying? Um, just when you say what your name is, um, what is something that you hope people is able to get out of this conversation? Ready when y'all are. Mark if I go. Hi, I'm Dr. Tatiana Moten. I am the executive director of Black and Pink National. And one thing that I hope which folks would get out of this conversation is understanding, a shared understanding. Yes, yes, understanding, understanding. Hi, everyone. I'm Victoria Kirby York, and I really loved, I'm still sitting with, and when you kicked us off talking about people being gender illiterate. And so I was like, look, let me write that down, make sure I remember who said it. So I give you proper, you know, citation, but <laughs> definitely going to be using that. I hope that people become gender literate from this conversation and that people also begin to see themselves in conversations around gender versus seeing uh, us versus them um, mindset. Yes, yes, definitely. I'm Jalen Scott, um, Executive Director, Lavender Rice Project. It's good to be with y'all. Look, I uh, want people to realize that Black trans issues are Black issues, period. And so we can start moving together and, and knocking down some of these walls. That's what I, I want out of this conversation. Good to mm. be with you. Mm. Hello, Brianna Jenkins, um, pronouns she, her, hers. I'm the National Organizing Director at Lavender Rice Project. And what I hope is that um, instead of um, Black folks saying they're your community, that um, we get to a point where we say our community because we are all part of one community. One thousand, wow. one, hey, one thousand percent. Um, jumping right into it, then jumping right into it. We know that there has been a concerted effort to criminalize. Uh, trans identity specifically on the level of youth we know that um, throughout the east coast to the west coast there have been a lot of states that have picked up on legislation that is uniquely targeted against gender affirming care for youth as well as just straight up accessibility for uh, trans and youth I mean uh, uh, for uh, trans youth and not only sports but also as different scholarship opportunities also just being able to be a part of the curriculum um Kicking off the conversation with that, y'all thoughts and what people should know about those. 
I think I'll go first just to set the tone. Um, you are correct. Uh, right now, trans folks um, are the top target of conservative politicians' um, rhetoric and air. Um, but I think what people should know that this is part of a coordinated and well-funded tri- strategy um, uh-huh. by the right to really push back against progress that not only trans folks that have made, Black um, folks have made, women and femmes have made. Um, and shout out to um, our sister Amara Jones, who has the podcast, um, The Anti-Trans Hate Machine, which talks about that um, more um, in detail about how it's a coordinated campaign to spread disinformation, to create fear, really to rally um, their basis so that they can um, pass these laws to make it look like they're um, doing something by targeting um, um, marginalized um, populations here in the States. And I'm, I'm there. I'm going to pick up what she's throwing down because, look, let's let's be, I, I want to make sure people have optimal clarity on this. And I'm going to throw out some, some sources for folks who are really into the, well, let me research what they're talking about. We could go back to 2015. And the Houston Equal Rights Ordinance fight, where in the city of Houston, one of the, I think it's the third largest city in America, there was a, a ordinance on the ballot that would have provided first of its kind protections, not only for um, sexual orientation, gender identity and expression, but the first local protections for black people, for people in the military, for people who experience discrimination for like nearly 20 different categories of life. And the opponents, to end it, simplified everything to not being about all the protections for all kinds of marginalized people, but put out one very cheaply made, poorly made, um, and well, uh, not well-intentioned video that made it seem like, well, if you pass this equal rights ordinance, there's going to be, and we're not talking about trans people. We're just saying they're going to use it. Bad people going to use it to try to harm People in the bathroom, they had some scary shadowy figure that they said, well, you know, regardless of where you stand on trans issues, if you pass this, it's going to be harmful. Made absolutely zero sense for reality at all. But because of that video and trying to use one community, a very small community at that, as the boogeyman, they ended up cutting out those protections for a whole lot of people, especially those that look like us um, in Houston which would have been really big because the state of Texas doesn't have civil rights protections, right? After that, you have HB2 in North Carolina. They try to do the same thing again, but there was a different answer. There's more examples I can give, but I'm gonna just leave you with these two because it, it shows you the, the power of what we can do when we all come together. They tried to do the same thing. They passed a bill that on its face, they focused on, well, we don't want trans people to use the bathroom, which people have been doing for decades and centuries with no issues, let's be clear. Um, But buried in that same bill, they gutted local uh, um, opportunities to pass uh, livable wages, climate change restrictions, uh, climate change uh, related regulations, and also civil rights protections. And on top of that, they gutted the state employment courts, which was where black people who can't afford to go the federal route could go and women too, when we're discriminated against on the job. They completely got rid of it. But again, only focus on the bathroom piece. What happened different and why this conversation is important in the black community is Bishop Barber and the NAACP said, oh, nah, not on our watch. You talk about black people as a whole. We're not falling for the okie doke. And for every week, for sustain for several months, black clergy, black civic leaders, uh, black members of the LGBTQ plus community and others, um, folks from all these other uh, movements, unions, everybody came together to push back against the bill and they were forced to um, come up with the compromise bill. And for the first time in North Carolina's history, a sitting governor was not reelected. The first time in over 200 years was not reelected. And people said it was because of HB2. And now after that compromise uh, bill, as of last, the end of last year, all of the rest of HB2 was also pretty much null and void. So that's the difference, right? When we see ourselves as one in the same, when we fight for all of us, we fight for all of us, right? Versus what happened in Houston, 
where people were easily picked off and were like, oh, that's not my issue over there. Oh, no, but it was. Okay. <laughs> so yeah. thank you, sis, for lifting that up because, yeah. you know, it is a strategy and it didn't yeah. stop with HB2. It's continued. And, and, and the, the thing about office, it, we know that real ahead. fast. We know that what, what what I think that these two sisters is illustrated is what y'all talk about when y'all talk about distractions and y'all say, hey, consciously, you shouldn't be focused on those issues. We should only focus on what's going on in our community. I believe that the white supremacists and the conservatives heard y'all saying that. And though there was a lot of funky energy for us to be against white supremacists and alt-right conservatives there in 2020, I believe like they dropped them guns down in uh, Chicago, the CIA did. They dropped y'all podcast mics and then they told y'all that we should be more worried about drag queens and story hour than we should be worried about them passing legislation that attack our classrooms. So when you peep game, while we worried about gender affirming language and being called a gender a, a birthing person while we worried about you feel me a, a, a story drag hour they literally passed some legislation to attack the black community and before before dr moan goes just ask for a total question two total questions was it the trans community that overturned the supreme court ruling of uh, affirmative action no was it the trans community that stops black people from getting loan forgiveness no just want to throw that out there. Make sure that <laughs> the reason why we having this conversation is about yes. Yeah. And, and I'm so glad that both Bri Brianna and Victoria brought that up because the, the interesting thing about it is that folks, these tactics that we're seeing play out are not new. They are coming from the same playbook. And just like Victoria said, the reason we have not have not had any issue with using the restroom that we have desired to use. What was actually happening in that state is that you all were indoctrinated hate and discrimination. What was happening is that you were allowing these people to come up to any person, regardless of your gender identity, regardless of your race, and say, I need to see your ID. And so that transcends yeah. us as trans people. And what we're doing is we're saying that even for those people who may not be nationals or citizens of this country, I need to see your ID so that I can prove your gender. But then that's another conversation that goes to other places. And what we're seeing through these legislative attacks are the criminalization of identity. When we are allowing, and I, it was something that has resonated with me and has stuck with me throughout all of these years, is being in uh, one, having one of my political science professors that says, most times when you see a lot of these things that are being since Alliance on the news media always go to C-SPAN. Pay attention to the bills and laws that are being passed in the presence of us being directed in these other ways, because our attention is so easily diverted to, oh yeah, they're talking about trans people in the bill in the bathroom. Just like conscious, I was looking at some of your clips on TikTok. I've never seen from Bugs Bunny wearing a dress, a person who says, oh, I want to dress up or I want to be a cross-dresser. I've never seen a person drop an anvil on a person's head because of these things, but no one is paying attention to the KKK that have been wearing dresses for centuries. Oh, God. And so we start to have these conversations and, we are, and we've, we've shifted from who the oppressors are. We've become oppressors of our own people. We're yeah. using the same tactics and playbooks that these people who have passed down to us and said, this is what is supposed to happen. It's Look, not about trans people. It is about yeah. our identity as Black people. Yeah, I'm a, th thank you for saying that. You know, the one thing mm -hmm. that I want to, for a second, because I live in Washington State, is talk to white folks, right? And these white progressives, because we're surrounded by them. But they're allowing this to happen further. They're furthering this narrative. They're furthering the, dis the distraction because they don't know the history. They don't know exactly what's going on comprehensively. And they're not letting Black folks take the lead on the response to what's happening in this country right now. This, there is a long history, right? There is a strategy about how they're actually approaching this. And we need white progressives to step back, to take all the seats, and put Black folks in leadership to start deciding and prioritizing for ourselves how we're going to approach this and what policy issues that we want to push forward. There's legislation popping over all over the country directly in response to bathroom bills and et cetera. But are those the priorities of Black community as a whole and Black trans community right now in response? Our response right now has been the thing that we always have done because we've never had full access to bathrooms. We've never had full access to gender affirming care. We've always done mutual aid. We always had networks to support each other, strengthening those networks and fighting as a whole comprehensively for Black liberation. That is a strategy I've seen in Black community and not 
about a million little progressive bills in Washington State that don't impact our community at all. And that's that's just, that's just what it come down to. And just want to be clear, want to be clear, want to be clear, want to be clear, want to be clear. To all the people watching this conversation right now, be very conscious of the optics and the aesthetics right now of this channel. Um, a lot of times when we talk about transness, it is done in a very oppositional way to what it means to be black. And what you see right now is we have black trans voices that are present. And when we put that little opposition, it literally erases individuals in the middle. And a lot of people do it in the name of being pro-black or being a pan-African. And what you do when you do that is, I believe you perpetuate white supremacy in a way that says that whiteness and white folks have power over all identities, first and foremost, especially what it means to be trans. And I feel like when you're supposed to be pro-black or pan-African or pushing the progression of black folks, we never want to give whiteness or white supremacy more power than it actually has, right? Right. A, a, a space where that really comes into play, I'm going to bring in the intersex community as well. I was on a, I did a Q and A um, on the new documentary, Everybody, uh, where we were talking about the impact um, of the film when it specifically comes to the black community. And one of the things that we do, because also there are people who are trans who also identify as intersex. There are cisgender people who identify as intersex, et cetera. And when we, when we get caught into this male versus female, man versus women, we actually also void out the reality of biology and the reality of socially constructed identities, right? Which is that they've always been on a spectrum. When you look at people who are born with uh, different um, chromosomes, genitalia, or hormones, and a whole host of other sexual characteristics, that's been happening since the beginning of time. The beginning of time. Right. And we often get caught up. I also just came from the Fellowship of Affirming Ministries conference where there's just 10 minutes worth of processions of black, queer and trans clergy, which was beautiful to see. And one of them remind me that the Bible says God made male and female. And we tend to interpret it as this or that as a binary versus and as and is used, which means we are all of us have mixtures of male and femaleness in us right some more on one side than the other and this some could be argued um as well when we talk about gender identity and expression and the ways in which that manifests as a spectrum because again we're dealing with a socially constructed concept much like race i identify as black i pull up my ancestry dna it's gonna tell you a whole bunch of other stuff that's not coded as black right but at the end of the day although i I identify with the binary of blackness. It doesn't mean that my reality isn't actually a spectrum, right? And the Ooh same is true when we talk about gender. Say what? 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 I I ain't even yeah. What? Come on now, come on. Now. <laughs> just, just, while we while, 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 while we while we while we get our thoughts together, just let me let me let me let me remind y'all real fast the people that's watching this kind of what's going on. What we doing real fast. Listen, if you like to get involved with any of the issues you heard discussed on this programming, check out the Elevation Fund, where we see education, entertainment, and equity all collide. But it's not just programmed off of likes and vibes. You can put your money where your math is and go to the Elevation Fund. Education is elevation. Check out the Elevation Fund. Is this thing even on? Yes, education is elevation. Um, say no to all the sucker shit. Um, listen, if you if you if if, if you are a, a a fan of truth, you see what I'm saying. If you are a supporter of truth, uh, do me a favor and um share this conversation. You see what I'm saying. A lot of times we have individuals that claim to be experts about transness uniquely, but they never have meaningful conversation or engagement with trans voices, and that's what the white folks do. When we think about how we are able to criticize white liberals for taking on the black identity and getting a whole bunch of, 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 of opportunity, funds, likes, attention, it's the same way of when we have individuals like myself that claim to be an ally of trans people, but then I never, you see what I'm saying? You got to let the rubber meet the road. And, and again, the, the, this conversation, ain't no white people a part of this conversation. They're all black people. Dave Chappelle and everybody in love Dave Chappelle. Pick game. These is black people on the screen. Thanks. 
floor is yours. <laughs> I, there is this association with, oh, sorry, Brianna, but there is this association with LGBTQ identity and transgender identity with whiteness. And I think that it is a long history of our moving, movement being appropriated by white people and their needs being put forward. But black folk, black trans folk, black queer and trans folks were at the beginning of the movement. They pushed forward pride. They were from the very beginning, they were the organizers. They were the movement builders. And blackness has always been a part of LGBTQ pride and identity, but that has been appropriated. And most of us grew up in an era when all that you knew about was the white gays, right? And white gay marriage and the association with whiteness. But we got to get over that because we have always had a sacred role in our community as transgender people and LGBTQ community. And so we need to find our histories and locate That's our right. histories and identify like where have queer, Black queer people been at the center of Black culture for a very long time and since since we've been Black, right? And so mm -hmm. if we can connect with that, we can disassociate LGBTQ identity with whiteness. And I think that will move this conversation a lot for a lot further forward. If you go to benhere.org, um, the National Black Justice Coalition was gifted the Ubuntu Biography Project, by, which was created by Stephen Magla, and it has biographies of Black LGBTQ plus trailblazers and folks who are on the come up now. So for people who are like, where we've been at, like, like she said, we've been here, right? That's a resource for you to be able to check out the many. We wouldn't have had uh, the March on Washington, which we're about to celebrate the 60th anniversary of, if it wasn't for Bayer Rustin, who coordinated the whole thing and trained, let's be clear, he was the mentor and trained Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, yeah. Re uh, Representative uh, John Lewis, um, and so many of their the folks in that movement. He he went to India to get the nonviolent civil disobedience training in person from Gandhi's followers and brought that to the United States into the civil rights movement. There would not have been those actions without Bayer doing that and then staying true to his commitment to blackness first and foremost. But just like was just shared, the LGBTQ plus movement appropriates black, queer and trans folks. The black community has also appropriated the things that we do. Angelic troublemakers is what created the good trouble makers that and righteous troublemakers, right? That Al Sharpton and Representative Lewis used. But that came from buyer. They just flipped the language, right? And so no diss to, the, to, to those brothers. I love what they do. But we often don't hear people then say, this is where it came from. And to educate people about buyer or about Reverend Dr. Polly Murray, who was sainted, who's brilliance as someone who would have identified as trans if that term was available to the to, to Dr. Polly then um, created the legal theory that Brown versus Board of Education uh, used to win against the Supreme Court. Also created the legal theory that Ruth Bader Ginsburg um, used to, to ensure that there was equal protection for women. So the, the jurisprudence over the last 50, 60, 70 years for equality in this country, including the recent Bostock decision, which um, had sex include LGBTQ people and employment discrimination, and the Biden administration has used that to have it represented that way throughout the government, was because of Polly Murray, a, a queer, trans, non-binary, somebody who passed as, a, as a, a boy and a young man throughout their life. You know, like, there's so much that the black community would not have if it wasn't for our genius. And let's be clear, the first drag queen in America on record was a black person. So we can't talk about drag story hours and all this. And we're not talking about the formerly enslaved black man who was a drag queen who also started a lot of what we call the ballroom community today. So, yes, Drop many snaps William, to the point William, that was William, made. William Dorsey <laughs> Swan. William Dorsey Swan. And I just want to say, because I, I can feel this question coming up. What what can black cis straight and let's be honest, black cis gay folk do to let's be honest and cis gay and lesbian folks do to support us? Part of my role at the Lab and the Rights Project and why I was brought on was to um, create sustainable and intentional relationships with our with other black trans led orgs across the country. And one of the things that I realized early on in my activism that um, nobody is going to save us as Black trans people, but we have the tools to save ourselves and we are saving ourselves. And it, it doesn't have to be this 
giant step for black cis folks to figure out what they can do. There are black trans folks organizing in this country, particularly in the deep south and in the Midwest where these type of anti-trans bills and all of this um, anti-trans disinformation is having its um, worst impact. Um, we at Lavender Rights Project, we're partnering with two black trans-led orgs here in Houston, the Mahogany Project and Saving Our Sisters United. I think of my sister's um, house in Memphis. I think of um, Solutions Not Punishment, Snap Co. in Atlanta. I think of um, Unspoken Treasure Society based in Florida, which we've seen has had some of the harshest and some of the worst, not only anti-trans and anti-LGBT laws, but anti-Black laws when we think of the um, anti-CRT laws. So there are Black trans folks um, leading our own movements, and oftentimes underfunded, not getting any of the funds, but um, still creating this network, um, risking it all to do this work. But Black cis folks either are turning a blind eye or they just feel like, well, this has nothing to do with me. And that is part of the problem. People are organ. It's you're choosing to distance yourself from the work. And, and typically, when black typically when black trans folks in the south are doing work in the south it doesn't just benefit trans black trans folks it benefits black cis um folks as well i'm thinking of louisiana and my sister um my um sister um wendy um, i'm forgetting her last name who who did work who's doing work to ban the cans can't stand law um that impacted um that impacted specifically sex workers that um, were charged with felonies for having to engage in survival sex work and how the work that um, she helped to lead as a black trans woman, not only helped to um, liberate um, black trans women who were sex workers, but also helped to liberate um, black cis women who were engaging in sur survival sex work. We are not hiding in the shadows. We are not scared. We are engaging in work and it has been documented you just have to, everybody has access to phone, everybody has access to Google, everybody knows how to pull up the transphobic interview where they're asking questions, but do you really know how to tap into um, your local community and really connect with people that are doing work on the ground, especially during these times? And mm -hmm. the, the harsh reality is you don't think that we're a part of your community, so therefore you don't think um, you should be invested in us, even though Black trans folks, we are living in, in Black communities. We're eating with y'all. We're in y'all families, but you just continue to ignore us. Why is that? And and how are you going to change that as the person with privilege? And, and this, 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 this as a as a as a cisgender straight Black man, what you just said sounds a lot familiar when we are talking to white people or when I'm talking about feminism and gender violence with cis people, right? When we're talking about cis women and cis men and we're talking about gender domination. I think what, what, what we heard the, these women get into right now is what I would call a, a trans erasure, but also this like Black LGBTQ erasure. When we start celebrating Black history, you feel me? Or when y'all want to start acting like having being trans is a new 2023, uh, 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 you know what I'm saying, invention. It's like, hey, there is a history, a and really rich history of not only black trans people existing, but uniquely contributing to black liberation. You see what I'm saying? And to me, when I think about, you know, the, 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 the background I come from in terms of the black conscious or pro-black, there are a lot of anti-trans sentiments that are 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 are, are reconfigurated as being some pro black shit, and it's not. It's not. To 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 to, to keep this conversation going, I think it's a part that I feel like to the parents watching this. You know what I'm saying? I want to acknowledge, hey, um, black queer youth, black trans youth, they are amongst a, a, a lean demographic for individuals not only battling with mental health writ large but literally struggling with things like depression and, you know, struggling with like unaliving themselves suicide. Um, to y'all, just a, curious, a question to keep this conversation going. When y'all hear black people say, you live in my damn house, unless you 18 under my house, under my rules. If you trans, you, you better wait till you 18 to be trans. 
What is your response to that type of ignorant? If you say that to your child, there's a good chance that they are not going to make it to 18. Period. It breaks my heart to hear and see those conversations happen. And I do want to name, because I, I neglected to say my pronouns earlier. I use VKY, she, and they identify as non-binary, but I am, you know, cisgender. And so um, I, I do want to name that because we're just having a conversation about allyship. Um, That'll be too busy. Um, but the, you know, we, we need our allies and more than that, active accomplices who are parents to do like we've seen the Wades, but so many others do to be bold and vocal and loud and courageous about your support for your child and to let them know, even when they're young, uh, younger, that regardless of, of who you are and how you identify, you are loved, you are affirmed and you can be all as I was saying, be all that you can be, be all that you want to be and achieve in this world. Because statistically, when you look at the numbers, the data that backs it up, there is a huge difference, huge difference, like night and day between the success that kids have when they're affirmed in their trans and or non-binary identity and those who receive that message from their parents that we better wait till you're 18. There's a difference in whether they survive childhood there's a difference when it comes to um, their ability to be successful in the careers of their choice and to know that they have choices, oh. right? The, the parent that is supportive is going to say, baby, if you want to be a dancer, if you want to be a doctor, if you want to be an attorney or you want to sit on the Supreme Court of the United States of America, those options are available to you. And too often kids who don't get that advice from their parents believe that there are only one to three jobs that they can actually have in this world as a trans person. And those jobs are fine, but you should also know that there are other options for you. And that is a difference maker when you come from a, a, a parent and a family and a community that affirms and loves you versus one that tries to silence you and to cut your wings. I think we, I like to think in affirming ways of our community and particularly of the black family and I think we're always trying to problem solve and, and, and address those issues that come up with problematic families and problematic um, storylines. But seeing the Wades, right? And seeing black families that are supportive of trans youth, we need to tell those stories because there's a lot more in my experience of black community, uh, even growing up in conservative Mississippi, right? And uh, being in Jackson, you know, majority black, solid, strong, uh, but very Christian and uh, rather conservative Christian, but a whole bunch of Democrats. And I think that's because we value civil rights. We value life as Black people. We value the protection of life. And we also have, I honestly feel like that Black folks got a little bit more room for um, an ecumenical accommodation of people and their differences than white people do. I'm sorry, they do. That's the way that I grew up. You love your neighbor. And we need to remember that about ourselves. And we need to be telling that story of Black families. I'm going to just get a little personal with my family. Uh, Baptist, missionary Baptist, uh, Pentecostal grandparents, right, in Mississippi. They, you know, they struggle. And they struggle with my coming out the first time and my uh, trans identity. And nothing about their faith says that I am okay and I'm okay to exist. But my family is a family of deep and abiding Christian love. And they, I, I was just, I'm shocked how far they have moved. I'm not saying that they are perfect. I'm not saying that I'm perfect. And I'm not saying that they even are thinking the way that I want them to think. But we have figured out ways to love on each other, to take care of each other. And I can guarantee you that every morning they wake up, they pray for my life and the protection of my life. That's what matters because you ain't gotta be my best friend. I ain't got to live next to you. You ain't got to take care of me. But I need Black folks to be standing up and caring about the life of their Black siblings, regardless of their gender. Mm. And we do mm. that as Black people because we are a people of love deeply rooted in Black love. I, I just want to hop in real quick. I'm going to invoke my sister, um, Diamond Styles, um, host and principal, um, principal, um, podcaster of Marsha's Plate, and she always tells the story um, about- Shout how, out to Marsha, man. Shout out to Marsha. Yeah, how to, shout out to Diamond. 
Um, she always tells the story of how she has this one aunt where, you know, she's older and she doesn't get everything. Like, she'll still get dead name when she comes around, but she knows that when she goes to town that she always has a place to stay and she always has um, food to eat. And I challenge us as Black people, I, I think when we talk about racism and when white queer folks get to control the narrative, it's only love and support looks this one way, but we know that being Black is complex. Um, I have some people, they might slip up with a pronoun. They might slip up with my dead name. It doesn't mean they don't love me and it doesn't mean that they don't have, I can't have grace for them, especially when I know it wasn't intentional, but it's about um, standing in our Blackness and um, allowing and giving ourselves permission to get love in this very um, nuanced way where, we, where we're just not shut out from systems of love and communities of care completely. And it kind of uh, allows us so we can define our own narratives because a lot of the stuff Black people, Black queer folks don't get the privilege to do a lot of the messaging or a lot of the narratives and because white folks get to do it, it's, it, it's never a both and end situation. It's either this and there are that. And even though so I, I'm a numbers person and the statistics are what they are, there are a lot of black families that are trying to make it work or that, that don't have the right language, but definitely love their, love their child, love their siblings, and they are trying to do right in their um, trying um, to come along and that just speaks to who we are as um, black people making a way out of no way um, showing love when we don't have the right language, when we don't have the access to the right tools and right resources but recognizing that um, the love is still there and the desire to have us a part of, because we do as trans folks bring value to blackness, we do bring Bring yes, our families. We are ne <laughs> we are necessary and we are needed. But um, I definitely wanted to um to color or add that piece to the conversation. Definitely. One of the things I wanted to jump in really quickly, and I'm a person who is I, and I say this with love. White supremacy is a mechanism of control. If they can get you to buy into it, they've already. We don't look to white people to be the exemplars of anything other than confusion and insanity. Dr. Cornell West said, because blackness must never be used to abuse other people, no matter who they are, because as we have these conversations and blackness comes up and folks love to decouple them, um, who they are, that's our spiritual and moral tradition. In, the, in that sense, the blackness and humanity intertwine, but never use as an excuse to dehumanize, dehumanize others. When we start to look at it, and Victoria kind of touched on this, it was cited in the 2015 U.S. Uh, transgender survey that found 39% of respondents experienced serious psychological distress in the months prior to completing the survey, compared to only 5% of the U.S. population. Stress and the need for accessible and culturally competent mental health services for Black transgender women must be put at the forefront of our priorities. And so when we look at these types of things and folks saying like, oh, you can be trans and, and all these other things, but you won't do it in my house. The reality is that what you're doing is you're forcing depression, you're forcing isolation, you're forcing minimization. What you're also forcing is a social isolation for your child. And so when we see the high, these higher instances of suicide amongst our community, because what we have to stop doing is stop comparing ourselves and our experience to that of white people. These things exist and have always existed. And I don't want to take, it from, take away from those parents who are supportive and loving of their children, because I had that experience. All of the things that society had told me would happen didn't happen. When I decided to live in my truth and, and being supported by my family, my grandmother and great grandmother from West Point, Mississippi, that wasn't my experience. And so the more that we push forward these experiences that this is what happens in black families, that's not true. And yes, there are instances where those things happen, but those are not the normative. And that should never be the experiences that we push for for other children. And so when we see these legislative attacks, again, what I'm talking, when I started talking at the top of this talk about the criminalization of identity, these are the same playbooks and tactics that are used before. The term walking while trans describes the reality that many transgender women, particularly those of color, 
facing being profiled and often arrested due to bias perception discriminatory laws. There was a time when walking while black was a real thing and it actually still happens in parts of this country. And so the rules and the stories and all of these other tactics that they're using, they're not new. We're just allowing them to to happen to us in a way that we're acting, oh, this is nice. And oh my God, this is something that has never happened. And trans people are using the restroom. We've always used the restroom that we were assigned and the ones that we chose. We served this country the same way I had to endure an administration where we had a president who has never served, not one day. I served honorably as a US Army intelligence officer for this country. So <laughs> for those people who are even in the comments, who are comment, the reason that I wasn't drafted I didn't register for the service. What I wanted to do is I wanted to be able to say that I fought for those rights that I complain about and those things. And so in essence, what I actually did was I gave you the right to hate me. Let that sit and resonate with you for a minute. As an honorably served veteran of this country, and yes, I was discharged honorably, I served for the right for you to hate me. And so when we try to invalidate the experiences of Black trans people and their contributions in this country, what we're actually doing is we're saying so an entire segment of our population who, our, who are our people, whether we want to acknowledge that or not, they don't exist. Uh -huh. But if we can erase the history, then we say, this is what happens. The same thing that you all tried to say, oh yes, LGBTQ history doesn't exist. And now look at what we're talking about. Critical race theory, which never had a focus about black history. Now there's taking and never. erasing the contributions that we have done for this country. For even folks who are saying that, oh, this is where we are and this is what liberation looks like. At Black and Pink National, what we say is that we're not trying to fix the system. We want to see the system cease to exist. That is the beginnings of Black liberation. I'm going to drop the mic, sis. Damn it. <laughs> hey, I think that she just uh, very masterfully illustrated the intersected and interconnectedness of race, class, gender, bitterly sexuality, and how a lot of times us as black people in the black community can be shoveling shit and doing the dirty work of the white supremacists and you don't even know it. See what I'm saying? I, I think that once I started to feel like our community had been convinced to be more against drag queens and more against trans people than you are against white supremacists, I knew, you see what I'm saying, that the pipeline to the conservatism was a lot deeper than what I realized. And, you know, it sounds like a lot of us are Southerners in this thing. You know what I mean? When I yes. travel the country and I'm and I'm and I'm when I travel the country and I get invited to the East Coast or the West Coast, there is an obvious distinctive progressiveness that doesn't uh, 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 exist. You feel me? Down South or in the Midwest. With that being said, though. What are some ways that we can show up for our black queer family in the deep south and Midwest and uniquely, you feel me, trans youth? But it, both of those, you know what I'm saying? Like, how can we show up for our, our, our family that's in the Midwest and the south, given how uh, dry, tumultuous, uh, 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 dehumanizing it is? Uh, to the people that's watching this, I have a lot of meaningful conversations. I'm 32 years old. I've been doing this since I was 18. And what I find is that a lot of my fellow black trans people down south feel like they can't be down here in order to survive. It, it, it really, it really, it really, it really make me feel some type of way if I'm being real. You know what I'm saying? Like there are a lot of beautiful, um, um, amazing mind can contribute politically, socially, economically to the experience of black folks down south. And they feel like, hey, Mr. Lee, conscious. Nigga, I couldn't, I, I didn't think that I could, could be down there. Um, how can we show up better for the people that may not have the resources to just pack their shit up and leave the South or the Midwest? How can we do better for those families that 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 that, that, that want to stay stapled in the South or the Midwest and don't want to go there? How can we show up better for them, for y'all? I want to jump in really quickly because I'm having had the experience of both living in the South, currently living in the South and being from the Midwest, but having deep roots in Mississippi. One of the things, and someone said it in the chat, none of us are free until all of us are free. And the reality is that there are a lot of amazing women and men that are doing the critically needed work in the communities that they're living and existing in. And it's not just for our communities. They're doing the work for all of our people. Because the experience of me being Black, I knew that I was Black and I knew that I was a woman before the world ever taught me that I was trans. Let's make that acknowledgement first. And most of the things that I've experienced, a part of marginalization came because I was Black, not because I was trans. That never came a part of the question. And so when we look at that and we, we have to question and ask ourselves, how can I show up for my people? 
that is a part of having the understanding or the shared understanding that community support and visibility, especially in regions that are known for these more conservative views, maybe they're not attacking you because you are this and that. They're attacking you essentially because we are Black. That is the experience yeah. that all of us have. And so yeah. when you question those things, how do you show up? Get involved. Support those organizations. We're not asking you to be Black and trans or Black and LGBTQ, but what we are asking you to do is speak up for those things that are affecting our people. My sisters are dying in these streets simply because of who they are. And I, I want Brianna to lead to Brianna, who's currently positioned in the South. And I, I'm with you, Doc. You know, if I think about the Kambai River Collective, Think about the strategy that they laid go out. Read it, y'all. Go read that combine. If you ain't, if you don't know what you're talking about, I would, I would, I would encourage you greatly to go become familiar with that. I didn't mean to cut you off, but no, you good. You drop you good. Rules, damn it. So you know, education is elevation. If you want to do better, goddamn, be better and learn better, do better. And I think that's a great one to, to go pick up. Go to Amazon, check it out or something. Look, but what they said is, and I'm not I'm not going to remember the, the quote, but if black women were free, and we say, you know, I say to myself, if black trans women were free. Uh, then all of us would be free, right? Because that would necessitate the destruction of all systems of oppression, right? It's right up in there. And the quote might not be exact, but it's up in there. And so we got to think that like these folks were not just talking about some theoretical ideal feminism that's about identity. They were laying out strategy for the entire Black community's liberation, which was to get us to focus in on the needs of Black women. And I would say for it, it, and right now in 2023, what's going on Black trans women? Because we have these intersectional identities and we are positioned in a particular way that if you want to move your strategy forward, the most effective strategy you can do right now is to look at the needs of Black trans women, get those met, because if that happens, baby, your movement is going to be good. And so right now, the place to do that strategically is for the most impacted Black trans folk and Black trans women, and that would be in the South. And so I challenge anyone who's doing organizing, movement building, any strategy work to really reevaluate their strategy, look at the Combined River Collective, look at intersectionality and rethink your strategy because you're missing something if you're not focusing in on Black trans needs. You know, Jalen, it's a reason that we work in, together because we we are on the same level. I have, I have three things I want to say because I know we're close to the end. First... It's not by mistake that we are here on this panel. We are, we're just not black trans women um, or black um, trans women and femmes. We are black trans women and femmes um, at, the, at the forefront in leadership positions um, in our own leading the movement, leading these organizations. Quite, we, need, we need money. We need funding to continue. We need unrestricted funding to continue to do this work. Like I said before, nobody is going to save us. Trust our leadership. Trust us to lead. I don't need the black system men, whether you straight, whether you gay, leading for me, speaking for me and my transness. We have we have the tools. We have everything that we need to lead our movements and save ourselves. It's all about access. It's all about finances, which unfortunately there are barriers we don't have access to, but we need to be tapped into those systems. We need to have access to those monies so we can redistribute it to our community in a way that um, lifts us all. So I, I can't be, um, I can't leave off here without saying this. We're in a time more, we're in a time where there are so many Black trans identified EDs. Um, I think of my sister Dominique Morgan, who's um, a Black trans woman leader in philanthropy. We've never seen this before. We are in, we're in a, a renaissance because when I first came into activism, I was told that all I could do as a Black trans woman is be an HIV tester and educator and I better shut up or I was going to get fired from my job. There was no place for me at leadership because so we're at a different time now. The second thing, and this is why we are working together, Jalen, this is why the universe has brought us together. And I, again, want to bring in my sister, Donna Styles, into the room because she helped me to see this. Donna and Marsha's play. Y'all better check it out. Go check that podcast out. If you ain't following her, go, go, go follow her. You know what I'm saying? We can, we can talk about white supremacy and anti-Blackness all day. But until we confront patriarchy and how patriarchy is at the root of all of this, 
and how patriarchy, even in our quest for anti-blackness, is what, is what has black cis men, gay and trans, feeling like they can be misogynistic and transmisogynistic and leave us behind and exclude us from movements. If we are not um, really trying to dismantle patriarchy with the same intellectual rigor as we do with with anti with um, my anti -black and my everything we are doing um, is for not and I I don't I like to give resources. There are already black cis men who are leading this work. I'm thinking of the A Call to Men organization. I'm thinking of prison feminism. I need particularly black cis men, but I need everybody to get on mm -hmm. the um, dismantling patriarchy train because if we're not doing that along with our our anti-black mm -hmm. white supremacy dismantling, then we're just doing nothing but um, repl replicating these systems and we're going to be back to where we started from. So one, um, trust black trans women and fem leadership. And if you can't give us the money, lead us to the money so we can get the money for ourselves and make sure we're doing our destruction of the patriarchy work because that mu we must have the same level of intensity and sorry black cis men but we got to get y'all we got to keep our foot on your necks um so that y'all can get it and don't take it personal but um it, it's what's necessary and that's all that i have to say yeah 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 before 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 we start going out i want to play this one more time so everybody know can listen man the, the the movement cannot be fueled with vibes alone. It just, it just Listen, if you like to get involved with any of the issues you heard discussed on this programming, check out the Elevation Fund, where we see education, entertainment, and equity all collide. But it's not just programmed off of likes and vibes. You can put your money where your math is and go to the Elevation Fund. Education is elevation. Check out the Elevation Fund. Thing, you know. Yeah, and before we get out of here, before we get out of here, you know, I want to thank y'all again for y'all time, y'all energy, y'all effort in having this conversation. You feel me? Being being real, uh, uh, trans transparent and vulnerable in having this conversation about what's going on in our community on a very public platform. Um, before we get out, though, if y'all would, uh, y'all can just give us your your, your organization name. How we can get more involved, um, and, and yeah, what we can, what we can get tapped in there. Where everybody noticing their money to? <laughs> I say, send your money to trans-led organizations, right? Um, we have a list of organizations on our website, www.nbjc.org. Um, you can find it in our resources section, uh, where you can see a list of organization, translate organizations um, across the country that you can um, help support with your dollars. And also make sure that, you know, one of the things that we do in building out our federal public policy agenda and our action hub, which are both also on our website, um, is ensuring that we're including um, trans voices, but then also are opportunities like White House listening sessions, you know, or opportunities with policymakers that we're not just speaking on behalf of community, but we're actually bringing people who are directly impacted into those spaces and into those relationships. I urge everyone um, to do the same and to also see your connections because it, it all, we all are connected. You know, when we look at the numbers of Black trans women who are murdered, and let's be honest, by our men, right? Going, by black men, right? Um, you, you also see disparities when, when you look at black cis women as well. Um, and Diamond Collier called me out on that. She said, when you talk about missing and murdered black women, don't just focus on trans women, focus on the inclusion of all black women and ensure that when we talk about black women, we're not excluding trans women by default or um, by the impact of the results. So doing my close out, but also wanted to quickly respond. Uh, to the last question. Make sure that you include in trans voices, you're funding trans organizations, and you're seeing the greater connection across communities. Um, we are, uh, thanks Victoria, we're Lavender Rice Project. Uh, we're headquarters in Seattle, Washington, uh, doing national work. Uh, we are out here pushing abolition, um, uh, violence prevention, 
and mm -hmm. economic housing justice. Uh, we're working through building and we're working for the entire black community. You can follow us at, at lavenderriceproject.org. Please also uh, give and follow and uh, uh, take care of our uh, sister organizations in Houston. That is uh, the Mahogany Project and Save Our Sisters United. They're in the heat the thick of it. And if you want to actually have impact, I would, I would connect with them and make sure they got what they need. It's good to be with all of you. And as I said, I am the executive director of Black and Pink National. We're an LGBTQ prison abolitionist organization supporting both our inside members and members that are re-entering in society, if you will. And a lot of the work that we can, that we are doing and uh, supporting can be found at blackandpink.org. As my sister Brianna says, we can't do this uh, work without your support and without your dollars. For those people who are continually saying, we support you and we love you and we want to see you do more, put your money where your mouth is because this work needs to be funded. And again, we are an organization does not, that does not want to see the system fixed because the system is working the way it was designed. We want to see the system cease to exist. And so when you support organizations like ours and all of the other organizations that have been presented to you today, that is the progression that we're looking for. As someone said in the comment again, none of us are free until all of us are free. That is a very real thing. And thank you all for this opportunity. Yes, 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 man. Um, did I miss somebody? Brianna, you went already, Brianna? I work, I work at um, Lavender Rice Project right. as well. So um, Jalen, capture everything. Make sure you are also um, following us on social media. Also, I sit on the national board, uh, on the board of directors for Black and Pink. So um, make sure you also support um, Black and Pink. I also sit on the board for um, the Mahogany Project in um, Houston, Texas. And I also sit on the board of the transgender district, um, hey, all hey. trans-led um, organizations that all are great organizations. I I put my money where my mouth is. I I I'm concerned in our community succeeding. You should be too. Learn about their work. Donate the money if you don't have the money. Use your network. Con con connect us. Get us to get us to the meetings. Get us connect us. Send an email. Send a set up a information call it, do, it doesn't take much it doesn't take much we are we are literally in the fight for our lives not only is our transness being attacked our blackness is being attacked we want to be able to go to college too we want to be able to send our folks to college too. You know i want to get my student loans canceled I wanna yeah. get, come, like come on like we need we what we know what the right what the conservative right has taught me is that they understand intersectionality very well. Why oh, they, they have one think tank, Alliance Defending Freedom, that is funding all of these frivolous suits that are going up to the Supreme Court. Go ahead and look. When you look at the filings for the Supreme Court, look at these law firms that are representing these people bringing these claims. Alliance Defending Freedom. If you trace the money, they're they're the one moms for liberty and all of this other stuff. It's all connected. Moms. They they understand intersectionality. And the only way that we are going to win is we are going to have to be intersectional as well. And we are going to have to be more than single issue um, minded. We have to be we have to be just as well funded, just as well organized talking to each other, valuing each other. And um, th this whole thing that we can exclude people and we can just disregard people, that is also a function of white supremacy. My blackness doesn't um, allow me to just exclude um, folks. Now, I might not like everybody, but my <laughs> blackness does not give me the privilege to exclude everybody because Everybody is necessary when we're talking about um, resistance and we're talking about supporting each other so we can make it to the day where we um, are free and we are joyful and all of those things. So um, yeah. we, 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 we got to get to the other side, y'all. Yeah. Hey, hey, shout, shout out to y'all. Definitely. I appreciate you all of y'all tremendously for being a part of this conversation. Um, hopefully we can set us a part two up. I think that's what we need to do. Set us up a part two. Um, we're gonna put we're gonna put our white man on it. Um Sam, I know you're watching this. Uh we need we need your labor, white man. Your your labor is required to do some organizing. 
we want to have a part two that is conducive and available today's schedule. Of course, um, I'm about to get a uh, hop on, off of here and get on to a uh, Instagram live with some people. Um, everybody is encouraged to uh, hop on to Instagram. And um, yeah, this conversation has been an amazing one. Uh, we out. Yeah. Percussion. Percussion.